Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on another lovely Florida. What the hell is today? Oh, I think today is Tuesday. No, it's Wednesday today. It is actually Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Uh, the weather is mild. There are not too many birds around. I can't really complain about that. Uh, I'm deep into the coronavirus whiskey because, again, I keep seeing the news and they say it's spreading everywhere, so I got to keep myself safe. And today I have this rather attractive 1977 Lincoln Mark V. Uh, now, when I say rather attractive, I have to put a little bit of an asterisk on that because it's not exactly the style that I would have chosen. I would not have put 20 inch Riddler wheels on my 1977 Lincoln Mark V, uh, nor Magnaflow exhaust, nor what have you. I wouldn't have a hot rod Lincoln per se. Uh, but, uh, you know, I get it. You know, the guy who did this one up, he took a very nice original Survivor. Uh, added these, oh, I don't know, pimp mobile wheels, uh, if you will, and, uh, you know, big pipes at the back. And, uh, I guess he sort of enjoyed looking like a rogue at the old folks' home. Oh, I, it's probably a fairly recent guy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I bought this car with the idea, okay, maybe I'll take the exhaust off it. Maybe I put the original wheels back on. Uh, because underneath those uh, additions is a pretty remarkably original uh, old Mark 7 and a uh, nice shape and a good driver and and then uh, you know I had some discussion with Peter about it. he said I oh, don't look sell it the way it is you know it's a, it's a pain every time we spend a month or two putting a car together uh, it just basically amounts to the same thing so yeah okay I'll give it a shot I'm gonna put it up like this we may run this car at Meekum it's coming up in a couple of weeks but uh, but either way I thought I'd throw it out there to the general public uh, the Mark series Lincoln has a pretty storied history the first one uh, was before the war uh, it did quite well uh, after the war, they came out with the Mark II, which probably is one of the more <sighs> storied, maybe not storied the right word, expensive is the right word. I mean, that thing cost the equivalent of 95 grand today back in the... Uh, uh, back in the late 50s. It was shocking. Hand rubbed lacquer, hand sanded, hand built. Uh, they didn't build very many of them and they sold even less because of the expense. Uh, but it was an incredible piece. Uh, and in fact, uh, at that point, Continental stood alone. Ford made it a luxury brand. Uh, you know, that was separate from Lincoln. Uh, towards the end of that run, they rejoined it with Lincoln and became, it, it, like, it is a very confusing model lineup. I have to say, there's like, any given year, there's like three different Lincoln Continentals. And uh, this uh, Mark 7 is a Mark 7. I do like Mark 7s, by the way. Uh, this Mark 5 is no exception. Uh, in 77, they had the Continental Sedan, which people look at and think is a town car, but town car was just an option package on the Continental Sedan. Uh, they had the Continental Coupe, uh, which looks like a two-door town car, like the 79 we reviewed the other day. And then they had the Mark series. Uh, and this one is the Mark V. Uh, the Mark III, when it came out, was the immediate predecessor to this car. Uh, it, it looked like this car, sort of. It was along the same lines. Then the Mark IV came along in the early 70s. And uh, that also sort of continued the... Uh, the deal, the way this thing looks. And then finally, this Mark V, which basically was the Mark IV with much sharper, much more creased and vicious looking lines. So uh, when it came out, it was the longest two-door coupe ever offered by Ford. I mean, no doubt. I mean, the thing's like 20 feet long and weighs about 5,000 pounds. It's insane. Uh, it is also it, it, truly the last holdover, the last full-sized American luxury dinosaur uh, that was offered for sale uh, in the United States. In 1980, it was all over. Uh, Cadillac had downsized in 77, Chrysler had downsized in uh, 78, and finally, uh, Lincoln, after the 79 model year where they pushed, hey, we're the last of the dinosaurs, uh, they downsized in 1980. And, you know, when the road and track, I think mean, it was Motor Trend, compared the Mark VI to the Mark V, uh, they said, you know, it's, it's a neat car, it's great in its own way, the Mark VI, but it does not begin to exude the same image that the Mark V did. This long, incredibly heavy, wasteful, you know, giant 
bit of real estate that was the Mark V, that full frame, you know, enormous. I mean, the, the way the country was going, we're at the height of the Malays era, and there was just no way uh, that any car company could justify wasting this many resources on, a, <laughs> on basically personal transportation, uh, which would usually end up being one guy. Uh, you know, your Barnaby Jones type uh, would end up in the Lincoln. The Cadillacs, apparently, at the time, the Coupe de Ville's, they were less money than this, actually. The Mark uh, V was more money. Uh, the Cadillacs were enjoyed by the Republicans and the, you know, the, the accountants and the successful people who wanted to be conservative. Uh, the Mark series, like this one, was, you know, the pimps, the drug dealers, the rogues, the, you know, successful musician type. You know, I think uh, Elvis Presley had one of these things, if I remember right, in fact, in 1977. And uh, anyway, pretty neat stuff. Uh, when they originally penned this car, the taillights were supposed to come all the way up and around here, but apparently focus groups hated it. Uh, the Mark III, I should add, which was the first of these uh, uh, cars was, well, famously, Lee Iacocca was running Ford at the time, or at least their design. He said, hey, to his designers, put a put a Rolls-Royce grill on a Thunderbird. And uh, that's how they ended up with it. And in fact, you know, this car did share the platform with the Thunderbird for many, many years, uh, almost from its inception through 1999 with just, I want to say, 1980 through 83 uh, as an exception. Anyway, let's get in the trunk. I do love this sliding emblem. I've always thought that's cool. I also like, you know, this is the kind of shit that we've lost in the world today. We don't have stuff like that. Two keys, a trunk key, and a ignition. Sorry for my bag of crap. Uh, you know, again, this is sort of a very original survivor type car. It hasn't been buttered up, hasn't been turned into a show car. It's just something that came out of an old guy's garage that then this guy bought and put wheels on. Now, Dalton detailed it yesterday for whatever that's worth, and frankly, it's not worth much. And you would think he'd come to me and say, hey, Bill, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a loose wheel in the back without a tire. You know, in case you get a flat, you might want to put... We have like 93 tires sitting in a corner for just such eventualities. And, uh, you know, ho-hum Dalton uh, deliverancing his way around the day. Just, oh, you know, this is good. I guess it's normal. It has a rim in there. I mean, you know, the kid is an absolute retard. And uh, it's, you know, bad enough that he can't do windows. But when he misses shit like this, I just want to punch him in the face. It's a little smirk off his face. <sighs> anyway, uh, you can see a very nicely finished trunk, the jack, the jack usage and stowage, all that's still there, and uh, very uh, ready to accept whatever it is you want to throw in there. Uh, this spare tire hump, one of the cues of continental styling over the years, and in fact, this car pretty much has all of them, uh, including the spare tire hump, also has the opera windows in the sides, the quarter top, uh, the vents in the fenders, the uh, you know, protruding uh, fenders on the front beyond the hood. Uh, you know, if it had a continental styling cue, then this car had it. Also has frameless glass, which I love, and this little vent window, which is cool as shit, but we'll get into that. Have a look under the hood real quick. <clears throat> I always have trouble getting into these hoods. What? Oh man, that's actually, it's not that heavy, thank God. Okay, now in 77, you could still get optionally this, the 460 uh, V8. With, with, in fact, even in the Malays area, it had more than uh, 200 horsepower or so. Uh, I would say it's special that it has the 460, but I think pretty much everybody opted for that. Uh, I mean, I think there were a few 77s running around California with the 400, the 6 liter, uh, but, you know, good God, nobody wanted that. So uh, most of these did have this big block 460, which, you know, shared architecture with the old 429 Cobra Jet and some other engines and really is a pretty incredible piece. Also the 390, I think, same architecture. Uh, you know, all the stuff that you want to see, the chalk marks, the stickers, the decals, all still there. Uh, there's the uh, mission sticker with the uh, info still on the side of the valve cover and everything looking very nice and proper under there, including the uh, hood sponge still intact. So nice stuff. Uh, also a big four barrel carb under there. Really and truly the last of the Mohicans. You see the Continental script on the hideaway headlight. Let's run those. Again, this would be nice to have people for this, but I don't. See if it works with the uh, car off. I think I hear him. 
Yeah, look at that. So there go the hideaway headlamps. They roll up, revealing four big round lamps, which that to me is just the coolest shit ever. Uh, I also love the uh, protruding cornering lights here uh, with this sort of clear... Uh, reflective, you know, picks up the light, Lincoln emblem. Uh, it's just beautifully designed and very, very, uh, uh, you know, artistic for the day. Also, the way the grill is, you know, it goes straight down behind the bumper, Rolls Royce style, as Iacocca intended. And uh, of course, the little bumperettes down there. And again, the length of this thing, absolutely incredible. And there's those rims. Uh, another neat thing, and uh, this is why I ordered a bunch of brakes for this car, but they're not in yet. The brakes are shitty right now. Uh, but it's got uh, these Riddler wheels. You can see this one had the rear disc brake option, uh, which uh, to me is pretty neat to see four-wheel discs on a 77 American Cruiser. Okay, inside, uh, this car was very well equipped in standard form, as this one mostly is. You could get all sorts of optional velours, like two or three levels of velours. Uh, they also had a leather option. Uh, they had like three or four designers that, you know, John Goaty and Tony Soprano editions and all that sort of thing you could get. So uh, Lincoln really played it up, and it became very popular with the... Uh, uh, the Guido set. Oh, I, I'm kidding. I'm sure it was popular with a lot of people. Uh, but again, a very different world from Cadillac, which was much more stodgy and conservative. Uh, you can see the car is in really... Let me get this buzzer up. The lights. Car's really in terrific shape. You know, original. I mean, it's got a couple little cracks here in the uh, door panel and stuff, but way less than you see in, uh, you know, most of the old abandoned hulks around. I mean, this thing is a true survivor. Uh, you got all this nice sort of faux wood with little flip-up ashtrays. That one's actually for the back seat passengers. Uh, you can see the Canadians are going to be pretty chipper back there. You got all kinds of brushed velour with room for three. Apparently, that's the original uh, plastic protecting that center seat belt. Who knows? Uh, I like the way the lights work at the bottom of the opera window outlet and original headliner and yeah, it's just all looking pretty cool back there. And of course, dual power seats, they came standard. Uh, all the wood inlay, all this other stuff. Yeah, it's all just neat stuff. All right, I'm gonna hop in, pull this car forward because I think Peter wants to photograph one, so. We're always in each other's way. It's gonna <laughs> fire up. Oh, for the love of God. Magda flows on an old Lincoln. Come on, man. I am gonna take this to Cookies. He's our local. Cookie, I mean, that guy has been around forever here in Naples. Uh, he's the guy who uh, put the uh, original turbo mufflers on my Firebird in high school. The shop's still there, and I'm not a young guy anymore. All right, so anyway, you hear that thing rumbling, which is all very neat, but what the hell. Anyway, you've got uh, a very attractive instrument cluster here with the uh, Cartier clock with date and uh, time and even a second hand in case you want to count out the laps around Sebring in this thing. I, I mean, that is just for a second hand. Uh, but uh, anyway, all very cool and appears to be still working, so that's neat. Uh, you've got automatic uh, headlights, automatic dimmer. You know, again, pretty expensive car in its day, so they had to put some stuff in there. Uh, it has just 58,000 miles on this thing. Again, that's as I uh, was instructed when I bought it, and frankly, it's all very believable the way it looks, drives, and feels. Uh, over here, you've got your wipers. You've got the original Ford stereo. Uh, tuning is, let's get the antenna up. There's the switch down here. I think it still works. Where are we at? Come on, I know it works. I saw it come up yesterday. I was running around with it today. Nah, it must be stuck down. All right, the hell with it anyway. That's fine because it's stuck on some Christmas station anyway. And I am the last guy who feels any kind of friggin' Christmas cheer. So uh, very offensive to me that I can't change it. It reminds me of being in high school. I had this old Hitachi cassette deck in my Firebird, uh, which uh, broke one day and wouldn't eject the cassette. And I had a Billy Squire Kasingam in there with Stroke Me on one side or the Stroke, whatever it was called. Can't remember the horrible B side. But I had to listen to that tape for six months, something like it, before I switched out the radio. And now I can't even hear Billy Squire without curling up into the fetal position and shaking for a little while. Total panic attack. Poor Billy Squire. It all went south for him with that one video where he was extremely effeminate. <laughs> 
I mean, oh my God, was it a nightmare for poor Billy Squire. Rock me or something, rock me tonight. I mean, he's leaping around in leotards with, uh, you know, aqua tank tops on that he's ripping off and rolling and writhing. Uh, you know, it was such a disaster that it essentially ruined his entire career. Here was this macho guy with Stroke Me, and, uh, you know, he went on to do this song. It became the subject of, I think, lawsuits, and, you know, people wondered, how the hell didn't anyone say anything? Billy, what are you doing? Stop it, man. Stop it. This looks like 80s German pornography. <sighs> Poor guy. Anyway, you see all the idiot lights there in the top, the uh, PRN, D2L in the middle, D21. Uh, you got a column shift. You got... Um, uh, tilt wheel, which works very nice. Uh, you got your cruise control in the uh, wheel itself. Uh, you can see this belonged to a Charles Heron. I haven't even thought about taking it. It's been on since 1977, probably. It's not coming off without leaving a mark, I wouldn't think so. Eh, it can just stay there. Somebody could use one of those little tape uh, label makers, click, 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 and put their own name over it. Uh, in the glove box, we got some fuses, uh, we unlock so the guy's Riddlers don't get stolen in the original owner's manual. All very nice. Is that a trunk release? It is. Trunk release as well. And then this amazingly ridiculous cigarette lighter from Lincoln. I mean, look at this thing. That has to be... The, I mean, BMW would be proud. <sighs> anyway. All right, let's go for a spin. <laughs> The expansive hood in front of me. I mean, look at that. It's like 19 feet of hood uh, with an ornament leading the way and those two big giant creased fenders on either side. Hilarious. Is the sun going to be in the way? Yeah, typical shit Dalton windshield. You see, he couldn't reach the middle of the front or whatever. I swear to God, that guy is a nitwit. Uh, so anyway, the opulence of this car was epic, and that was another thing Motor Trend touched on when they did the review of the uh, 79 versus the 80. Uh, they said this thing is a giant full-framed boulevard and highway cruiser that makes the occupant feel uh, very, very wealthy and prosperous in a way that the newer Lincoln did not. It made, you know, made that guy feel like sort of a well-to-do accountant or something. I mean, this was decadence, absolute 70s decadence. Uh, that said the hell with your gas crunch, the hell with all your issues, the hell with, uh, you know, the Democrats in Congress. I am going to enjoy myself and have a lot of natural resources tied up in one four or five thousand pound car cruising down the interstate. And God bless them. That's what they did. So it, it does. I mean, it just... Uh, completely detaches you from the road. Uh, you feel this incredible sense of, uh, again, navigating a land yacht, picking a point in the distance and just making course corrections towards it. No wonder these old guys put compasses on their dashboards. It's like they're driving uh, sea rays or carvers. Uh, and uh, it just is the end of an era. This is the last, think about that. That's an incredible statement, but it's a true statement. This was the last true American full-frame, full-sized luxury dinosaur uh, that was designed in an era where nobody gave a shit about natural resources or, you know, their fellow man or anything other than just full-on personal luxury and uh, enjoyment. And this was it. When this was done, when this car was spinning, they still had full-size, full-frame cars, but not like this, not 20-footers. You know, not the longest two-door coupe ever made by the Ford Motor Company. That was, that was ended. That was over. And uh, frankly, I'm happy to have this car and drive it around because it feels nice to relive that era uh, back at a time when people seem more cheerful. Uh, anyway, this one is available at... Um, uh, Auto House of Naples, you can give them a call at 239-263-8500 on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, I'm going to have it for a while. I don't know yet if I'm going to run it through Meekum. Uh, I'm going to price it fairly cheap for what it is. I mean, if you know, if this, if you want to do the work instead of me, that's fine. Put the original turbine wheels on it. Put on some Cadillac mufflers, and all of a sudden you've got a real, you know, 58,000 mile survivor on your hands. That's uh, 
going to be not quite as impactful as it is when you see these 20 inch Riddler wheels. So you probably get eight, 900 bucks for the Riddler wheels anyway. Somebody wants those things. Uh, but if it doesn't work that way, then I'll probably do it myself and run it through another auction. And eh, we'll see. We'll see how time goes. We've got a lot of cars that are in the project phase. So it makes sense to try and move one without putting too much time into it to uh, change things around. Sourcing those wheels, it's not hard, but you know, everything takes time. I love that Cartier clock. That really is just cool. So anyway, if you have an interest, we appreciate it. Give those guys a shout, and I will see you with the next one. Take care. All right. Quick addendum. I did manage to get the uh, antenna going. Look at that. Oh, boy. Driving with the knee. Turn this on. We'll get our Christmas music. The only thing I'm able to tune in. I also didn't show you how cool this little smoker vent window is. Look at that. <laughs> oh, yeah, knee driving. Not fun. Anyway, here's our little highway cruise. This is what it was built for. in the distance and head off. Pretty amazing old car.